goes to Sean Colvin and John Liventhal, songwriters for Sunny Day. John, uh, tell us about the uh, the guitar you've got here. Uh, this uh, has a a long history. Um, <laughs> well, I guess I'll tell it to you. Um, yeah. This is my road guitar. I actually don't use it that much in the studio. In fact, hardly ever. I don't think I've ever I haven't picked this up in the studio in twenty five years. I don't think. Um, I, so um, I think I'm a little schizophrenic uh, in the sense that you know I kind of have my performer side and then my producer slash session player and studio musician side. Okay. And they're kind of, it's two, it's, I think about them slightly differently. Obviously there's overlaps, particularly when it comes to the music itself. But as far as getting a tone and, you know, and all that, I think about them slightly differently. So this works really well for me live, but I have lots of guitars that'll do the various things that this does in my studio. So I tend not to grab this and keep this in a road case. Uh, I don't know if that's, I don't know why that is, but that just is. Um, I actually got this guitar in 1977. It was given to me, uh, it's a sad story, I don't want to derail our thing, but I had a good buddy and he passed away and this okay. was his and his parents gave it to me. It was really, uh, you know, pretty amazing. Um, and it, it just uh, coincided with uh, me sort of wanting to get a Telecaster anyway. So this is, in some ways, the guitar I really learned to play on. Uh, this is not the original neck. I had, it came with a kind of a, this was, a, I think it's a 1970 Tele, and it came with a relatively skinny neck. And for a long time, I was like, oh, I guess I like skinny necks, right? Um, and I had the neck, I used it for a while like that. I had it refretted probably when I was really using it a lot, like playing four or five nights a week. Uh, probably had it refretted two or three times and it just started the skinniness started to wear away and i started playing other guitars that had slightly bigger necks and i said well what would happen if i put a bigger neck on it so i got uh like a this is from a, a uh, some custom shop telecaster so one day i just took it off the custom shop telly which i liked but didn't love and i put it on this and this guitar transformed it became great i can't explain it there's that weird chemistry with Fender guitars sometimes. Just right. nobody, if, if they could figure it out, they'd make it every damn time. But there's some necks love to be on some bodies and vice versa. And it, you know, I have a, a bunch of tellies 
A couple of them are light and they're great. I have one or two that are light and they're not so good. And I have one or two, I like a heavy one that's okay. And this is a fairly heavy one and it's just great. So go figure. Anyway, that's the story of this guitar. I've had it for a long time. In the early days of playing on records or producing, I did use it a lot, but really, um, I kind of hung it, hung it up in around the mid nineties, I stopped using it. Got another telly I like a little better and stuff like that. So what kind of pickups are in it? Okay, we're going, oh geez, oh man. Well, this is made by this guy, Peter Florence. Yeah. Voodoo pickups, right? Good, great. And name. I don't even remember how I found it. I think there was a repair guy in New York who told me to try it for the, so my thing with tellies, I mean, I love tellies. I love classic telly sounds and classic players like James and Clarence White was used for me. Um, but I've never really wanted to go after the Bakersfield or the full on, full on twang thing. I mean, I like it and I'll do it. And I, when I was younger, I did it in bands, but I don't need to do it on record. So I've always tried to find a uh, telly pickup set, had a little more, uh, a little attenuated that, that ice pick thing. Like I don't like the ice pick thing in tellies. Um, so part of my quest for the telly tone is to find the guitar and the pickup combination that still gives you the clarity and a bit of the twang, but doesn't have any of that ice pick. Peter's pickups just do that for me. <laughs> that his pickups work for me, and I have them on a bunch of my tellies. Actually, this this is a bit of a, a little bit of an ice picky amp for me, but well, I was playing through my own amp, it would be right. That's that. So I have no earthy idea what this is. <laughs> I, I, for, um, so in the 80s in New York, I may have mentioned in the 80s, if you were going to work either doing gigs or on sessions, particularly jingles, um, the strat, strat sound was everywhere. I would think it was the same here, right? It's like yes. even Reggie Young yes. had a strat, right? Um, and I think in a way I ended up, I think he did sort of eventually more or less the same thing. So I never felt totally comfortable on a strat. I had one and I was like, God, I'd rather play the Telecaster, but I needed that sound, right? <laughs> So I, I routed it out. I put a pickup in there. This actually, okay, I know what this is. Uh, Lawler. Okay. They were sweet enough to give me a, let me try a couple of their pickups. And I like this a lot. I think this is a slightly beefed up version of it. Uh, thing, maybe like what they intended for this position. Okay. This is uh, always a quest for me. So I have a bunch of Telecasters uh, uh, early on in the 70s. I don't know about here, but like, so Cornell Dupree was like, one of the main guys in New York, New York, and he played a telly, Bon Telly. And we all thought, oh, that's so cool, Bon Telly. And he had like a Bjarman pickup in the, yes. this position, right? And everybody started swapping out their uh, neck thing. And I did too, like, uh, I didn't, the, the, you know, most of these are, uh, real telly pickups, they were a little too thin and glossy sounding for me. So I put mini humbuckers in a, the two tellies I owned in the 70s, and I love those, and I love that sound, and I use it for a long time. Um, and over the years, I've tried pretty much everything in this position. I have a telly with a real humbucker. I discovered I really like those wide range telly pickups from the telly customs in the 70s, but I hated those guitars, so I made a telly myself where I bought a, a wide range pickup put in there. I love that. But you know, every now and then I'll hear somebody else play with this pickup and I'll go, God, that sounds good. Like, I think I saw a video of, uh, I don't know, who it, was. it may have been Ed Bickert, like the jazz, a Canadian jazz guitar player. And it's like, how is he getting that sound? How'd... I So I just decided I'd go on a search and I bought like five or six versions of this. And this is the Fender Twisted Telly. And on this guitar, it works for me. So... It has warms. Uh, it has everything I like. It does. I really like it a lot.
So I like that pickup a lot. Now, if I put that pickup in another telly, maybe not. But I do yeah. think there's kind of a uh, unexplainable voodoo mix of pickups and necks and bodies. And so I will tinker with Telecasters. That's the only guitar I'll tinker with. I do. I do so kind what, of a workbench, and I'll tinker with them. What are what are some of your uh, what, are, what are some of your favorite tellies? The ones that you use to record with. Uh, so I have a bunch of tools. So I have this one that stays pretty close to the control to the mix the you know the workstation. I guess I should say now. Uh, it's I guess a '68. I think it's a '68. It has a rosewood board. I put a mini humbucker in it many years ago. I used that a fair amount. Uh, for a while, it depends. Like certain records, it's weird. I don't, so it, it's complicated. And my record making thing is like, I try in some ways as a producer and engineer, because I engineer my records now, I try not to, you know, if you do anything long enough, you'll start, you know, wearing a path where if you're starting to get decent results, you'll kind of tend to go toward that. And of course, that makes sense, you know. Um, you know, as an arranger, as an engineer, uh, or even a player, a lot of times I force myself not to use the same tools all the time. So from one record to another, I may just intuitively not use a Telecaster. Like I don't, I didn't really use a Telecaster on this William Bell record. I used my Gibson L5. I just thought it would take me to a place where I wouldn't repeat myself as a player or, or uh, an yeah. arranger and it was great. Plus, I honestly think back in the day, there were a lot of session guys who were, weren't using tellies and strats on R&B and soul records. They were really jazz guys coming in with arch tops and playing bluesy R&B soul stuff. Like, uh, like, uh, do you know the record uh, "Clean Up Woman" by Betty Wright? The soul yes. record. Yes. Three. You know, it's got those three like totally incredible guitar parts. You know what the first is. Then he overlaps. That's this guy, Little Beaver, who was a session player in Miami. He did it all in an L5, and that's some of my favorite R&B guitar playing. So I did most of uh, Williams' record on my L5, on either this pickup or that pickup, and mm. it sounds great. I love it. I guess so I try not to repeat myself, but yeah. I do have, I do love my heart. I have a lot of heart for Telecaster, so I do love Telecaster. Yeah. Yeah. I guess also there was less temptation to kind of play like Reggie Young or Steve Cropper. Uh, yeah, maybe. Although I, I can default to that pretty easy. I mean, I love I love Cropper. I've never quite defaulted to that. But Reggie Young, I mean, he was really great template for a guitar player for me. The, the, the economy, the dedication to the parts, the things that would speak on the radio and the little hooks. And, you know, he was, uh, if you talk to Reggie, the one or two times I've talked to him, you know, he says a lot of that. Bobby Womack was a huge influence on him, right? <laughs> You know, a lot of these kind of double stop, sixth, and all that kind of sensibility uh, which Reggie had, and a lot of those great R&B guitar players had, and all this what I call butterfly playing, like, you know. That's coming a lot, I think, from Curtis and Bobby Womack, and Reggie picked up on it. A lot of guys I picked up on it. Hendrix picked up on it, right? Mm -hmm. That's like Little Wing and all that stuff. That's really that world, you know? In New York, uh, Cornell Dupree was kind of the New York version of that. And why do I love, I love all that guitar playing a lot. I've always, I don't know why I do, uh, but man, I just, if a guitar player just starts doing all this stuff, you know? <laughs> Particularly at 12 8. I mean that that just speaks to me. So how did you end up being a, a telly guy? You know? I just love tellies. I do. They're my voice as a performer, but not as a recording artist. Like I would probably be uncomfortable on stage with my L5. I wouldn't quite know how to control it. I can get on stage with a telecaster and I can control it. And the volume control's right there, and the tone control's right there. It's simple, it's straight ahead, the versatility of this and this and this guitar, this. But even if I didn't have that, I can cover everything. I can do everything on it. And it just, it feels as a performer like a natural extension of me, like no other guitar does. 
And like we all do, you know, you know, it's like I'll be, I'm sure when I'm 91, if I get to 91, if like somebody says, man, you ought to check out this telly over here. It's really good. I'll be over there, right? The quest for the best telly, like there's, like there is one, right? But yeah, I mean, you know, and you can kind of beat it up and stuff. I do a lot of this where I shake the strings, you know. Uh, and it's harder to do that than other guitars. While we're, what kind of, uh, I, I noticed that you've kind of will palm the pick some. And you, and yeah, you, and go I got a, a fairly un unorthodox thing going on. So, I mean, I do all, you know, I mean, I'll play that, but a lot of times I play with all my fingers. And so what am I going to do with the pick? So I've gotten used to doing yeah. that. So I, you know, I play, uh, I think a lot in terms of uh, what's the fewest notes I can play to make the biggest sound um, uh, and so that and also I you know so that means open what you know they call open voicings a lot instead of just playing like a D triad there you know So in order to do that, I gotta free up like someone like Rye. I, I mean, I would have, I don't know, I guess that's me, so that's nice, that's a thing I've done, but I think like probably the antecedent for me is kind of Rye, who doesn't okay. use a pick, but you know, he's very much, you know. I do that too, but I gotta put my pick away. Thing is, I've never tried to sound, I've never tried to like, like I love Rye Cooter, like I really do, but I've never sat down to learn or work out anything he's done. I've just tried to kind of like take it in, take it in, you know, and see if I can appropriate it somehow and just take it and let it become some part of me, you know? So. Pretty effects. Anyway, so, there you go. So, what what kind of a pick do you have there? It's a big old, big old. Check it out. Of... Yeah, I've gone through lots of things. This is what I've settled on now. What and what is that? Well. I don't know. It's made. I think it's made by Dunlop. Okay. Um, I don't know if it's because I'm getting old, but uh, I have a friend who owns a music store outside of Toronto, a vintage guitar store called Folkway Music, and I bought a guitar from many years ago, and he said, try these picks. So he sent me these um, large, this uh, I, was, I used a standard pick for it. He sent me these large Ivroid picks. Okay. And I play acoustic too a lot, you know, and uh, you know, I can uh, dabble in a fiddle tune or two and flat pick and hit it hard and, you know, really torque into the guitar. And I started really liking these Ivory picks this size and they were really ex like the, what's, whatever's past extra heavy, they're really thick. And I liked it. I felt like I was getting more tone out of the guitar okay. and a slightly darker tone, which I like. And so I started really liking these really thick, large picks because I felt like, um, I think like bluegrass guys probably use them more. And then uh, I just saw this in a music store. I thought, well, let me try these. And I ended up liking these a little bit more. Um, I could not use a small pick now to save my life. I just feel like I get a meatier tone. And I, I, play, uh, uh, I play assertively. Even when I'm playing light, I try to play like assertively. So I'm really digging in. Like I, I, I couldn't play a Telecaster with 10s. Yeah. Like the lightest strings I have on any guitar is 11s. 
Okay. So you're using 11s. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. I got. I just feel like it makes everything work better. Yeah. I do. I feel like it makes it a more stable instrument, and uh, you get a fatter tone. I mean, people comment on like that. I get a kind of fat telly tone, but I think it's because I have heavy strings, and uh, you know, I, I think I think just better. I think all yeah. the way around, it's better. And another thing I've I've noticed uh, seeing some clips of you playing, you uh, you also use uh, capo. With the uh, with the electric and I've seen oh, yeah, you use of some. Yeah, use sure. some uh, in fact, I've seen you use some different tunings. Oh uh, yeah, too. I use tunings a lot. Yeah, that's uh, definitely something I do. Uh, I have this one tuning. Oh my god, that I'm going to reveal. Should I? Yeah, I have this one tuning that I use a lot. It seems like I get asked. To... So tell us about the tuning. Well, it's basically uh, what did I call it? What's the real name? Sebastopol tuning, or it's it's like G tuning, right? Okay. Uh, but I take, but I don't tune the high string down to D, which I think okay. your standard sort of tuning would be, and I tune the low E string down two whole steps. Okay. Right. So it gives you this kind of nice. Um, so. playing in the open position right. but I mean I've used it so much that I've now I can kind of really navigate it in any key so I don't have I don't feel I don't feel tethered to capo in here and having it to be in this key right because right. I can now so it gives you these also these beautiful uh, what I call open voicings where the notes are actually spread and they have a kind of beauty to them right a real lush This part, this part is all normal. So up here, right? Right. Then you get that, which is nice, right? And it's also good for. Um, God, I'm giving away all my secrets. It's also good when it's in tune, but it's it's great for. Um, well, it's great for bluesy stuff. It really is, and for. Dare I say it? Um, kind of stone stuff, you know. Right, and it's great for. So it's great. It's got a lot of possibilities. I've written lots of songs with it. Like I wouldn't really use this song like the record I did with William so much. One song I use it on the Jesse Winchester cover, but um, yeah, a lot of my songwriting with my lovely wife and I think Colvin and some other people. I've uh, it's a, it's a good strategy to use to just break away from just your standard chord structures, right? Because it really has some lovely dissonances that are inherent in the tuning, you know, you know, and lots of, lot, not, lots of these options for these nice kind of, but I, I'm particularly fond of Sean Colvin to get out of this house. Did that utilize that? Totally. Too? Yep. That's okay. exactly what that is. Yeah. Okay. That's the t most people have asked me about that. Like, what are those yeah. chords? It's like, yeah. it's all coming from this tune. Yeah, it's a great tuning. I stumbled on it somehow. I mean, it's obviously it's not like a revolutionary thing. It was just committing to really learning the guitar with your low E string down to a C. And it's just taking the time to really learn your instrument and what the options are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you tend to tour with kind of um, 
in a minimalist fashion. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. You seem to have, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't <laughs> yeah this is a lot. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't think I've done a gig with my own amp in 20 years. I mean, it's the, the funny flipping answer would be I'm just lazy, uh, which is true. But I think um, of your three major recording centers, LA, Nashville, and New York, well, you know, nobody drives in New York. And so the end game of that is the less you bring to any musical thing you're doing, a gig, session, rehearsal, that's sort of the template. You learn that pretty early on. It's uh, it tough, it, you know, New York's got, uh, you know, the, the street vibe of New York, the New York music thing is it, what's the right word? It toughens you up a bit. I mean, not that, you know, every music scene is gonna toughen you up, certainly emotionally in some ways, right? And professionally, but the New York thing is really, uh, I mean, I'm not, this is not unique. It's like most guys, like, what's the least I can bring get away with it? No, the downside of that is, you know, it's probably nice to have your great, your perfect amp and stuff. And, you know, if you need a large pedal board, bring it. But um, the upside is it forces you into learning how to be musical under battlefield conditions right certainly uh, i mean it can break some players like i can't get my sound man and i can relate to that i'm not happy you saw me play like last night i, w I was struggling with my guitar sound all night okay. like, you know. so but you know given that and being the band leader and directing the nine piece band it's like okay stop whining that and just do the gig so um it forces you to just figure out even with not optimal here you still have to be music and in a way, I think that's a good answer. Because so, at the end of the day, anything that thrusts you toward being musical is just going to make you a better musician. Mm -hmm. So what's your ideal amp? What's the amp that you use to record? Well, with? I have a bunch at home. So, I mean, like most people I have, I've had, uh, the, the, I've owned, the first amp I own, which I still, which I still own, is uh, like a mid-60s Super Reverb. And I used that in my early, when I was young and, and strong, and I could carry it. I use that on most gigs. And then eventually it's like, well, this is too heavy, really. And I got, um, you know, 30 years ago, I got uh, like whatever, 64 Blackface Deluxe Reverb. And I still have that. And that's kind of a great all-purpose go-to amp. I still love the way my amp sounds. It still sounds good. I think I've swapped out speakers. But over the years, you know, I have, uh, I love, a, I have a Princeton that's probably my most used recording amp. Uh, and I put a 12 inch speaker in there a number of years ago. I just was curious to see, would it make it, um, give it a little more headroom and just, just give it a little more je ne sais quoi. And it does. A yeah. Princeton, a good sounding blackface Princeton with a 12 inch speaker. It's a really killing amp, yeah. killing amp. But over the years, you know, I've got a bunch of, got a few of these uh, like late 50s Tweed Gibsons that I like a lot, a GA18 and a GA20. The GA20 is a great recording amp. It's a little bit like a Tweed Deluxe, but a little bit, a little, got a little more bottom to it, but it has a beautiful little, it's my go-to amp for a little grind or hair on it. Okay. And that, those are the main culprits. I mean, I have a few little more exotic, weird things, yeah. but. What kind of 12 did you put in the Princeton? Oh man, I don't remember. By what current maker? I did a little research and my memory's so bad I can't remember. It's an Alnico. I think I wrote to some current maker and there's so much stuff out there and I, you know, I don't like to get too bogged down in it. Yeah. I'm sure I asked somebody and they said, these guys and I just wrote to somebody and said, oh, we'll try this and it sounds great. Yeah. I mean, I like that. I like the, you know, my home base is a blackface Fender the only one I don't like is a twin reverb. That's the only blackface Fender I've never figured out how to get a sound of. But a Vibrolux reverb, a Deluxe reverb, even a Super reverb, and a Princeton, those four, those are that, that, that's home base for me. Yeah, That's where I'm the most comfortable. If they're in shape, they sound good, and the speakers aren't too tired. They're good because they have that thing where they're they're basically clean and articulate, and you could just get them right to that notch where there's just the right amount of hair and dimension around the note. And that's where I live. I'm not a particularly overdriven player. If I need a little overdrive, I'll tend to get it live from the pedal or in the studio. I'll just turn the amp up, you know. Um, I don't use pedals in the studio very often, very rarely. If I'm going for some kind of weird sound or something, I'll use it maybe occasionally a little delay, but really, 
would never, I, w I don't think I've used a distortion pedal in the studio in years, or maybe occasionally a tremolo pedal, but mm -hmm. even that, nine out of 10 times, I'll use the tremolo on the amp. Tell us about your uh, minimalist yeah. board that you- Well, this is actually my B-Rig. Uh, it's essentially a duplicate of my main one. This one doesn't, uh, this one uh, is really my backup. It's a little small. It's it's kind of uh, mounted on a smaller thing. So on this run, I really literally wanted to throw every my clothes and this into a suitcase. Um, I've settled on everything in here is, I'll probably never need another version of, but the distortion pedal thing is always variable. This is not, what I normally use. I normally use um, uh, a Mad Professor Green Wonder, which my friend and great guitar player, Kevin Barry, turned me on to. He plays in Rosé's Bane. Beautiful player, like one of my favorite guitar players. And so I tried the Green Wonder and I love it. Um, that's on my other thing. Uh, my friend Mark Shulman gave me this and I like, it's okay, I, it's okay, it's all right. But I didn't use compression live for a long time, but my friend Eddie Berman said to try this, and he says it's the compressor for guitar players who don't like compression, okay. and he is right. That is kind of like having an LA-2A slightly on, L, you, if you don't know an LA-2A, it's like That's great, a, you know, classic. Rack compressor. Yeah, um, I love it. I, I just turn it on and leave it on. It just adds a certain solidity to the sound and just slightly takes up the dynamic slack in it like i really hate what i tend to hear in nashville now like just that super compressed like to me that's just white noise but this just feels like a great old audio compressor to me just slightly evens out your thing but the attack is all still there and uh you don't hear it all squashed or anything um you know so this is the turn you know. turn everything off but that Yeah, that sounds very musical to me. This, um, for years I looked for the right tremolo pedal. A lot of them, you would have a slight gain drop when you turn it on live, it used to drive me crazy. And then uh, this, somebody told me, just send one of these boss pedals up to this guy and he fixes that and he did. I bought two of them um, and it works. It's good live pedal and they're indestructible. This I've had, you know, I bought two of these in the 80s and I kept them and I'm glad I did, I love them. So I use that only for slap back because I'm too lazy to bend down and change the setting on the other one. Absolutely. Right, yeah, so I wanted Why? one for slap back and uh, yeah. So it does that and then this is, you know, for your more luxurious, you know. I don't even know how let's hear it. This, uh, and the reason I like this pedal, people less, sometimes like, like it's not a cool pedal or something, but it's small and it has tap tempo. And it has all the subdivisions you need, dot, you know, dotted A, you know, triplet and stuff. And I mean, to me, for live, that's just really handy. Hell, man, you could put 10 delays up here. I bet you most musicians couldn't hear the difference from delay to delay. So, um, so you know, for giving it some space, I use that. That's a pretty simple. I don't really have... Uh, I used to back when I think I was a little more invested in sort of some quirky guitar sounds. I had a few other little weird things, but I gave up on being quirky about 10 years ago. So there you go. I just like real guitars that sound like real guitars and not too overly affected. And, you know, I like a bass to sound like a bass, a snare drum to sound like a snare drum. And, um, William's record, um, yeah, it's like, uh, I just really wanted, like, I like the way records sounded in the 70s. <laughs> You know, I, I wanted it to kind of, without doing, like, copying it, I wanted it to feel like, oh, it's recorded in the 70s. It sounds good. You could hear the snare drum. I had the kick drum. Hear every instrument. Had a real clarity to it. Not a lot of reverb. I like it. So, there you go. Well, John, thank you so much for coming down. Hey, man. It's a pleasure. I never really get to talk about guitar stuff, so that's that's kind of a treat for me. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. All right. Cool. Bye.
Like to me, that's, even though it doesn't sound like him, that's coming from James Burke. I don't know if y'all can hear that, but James used to do this thing where he would bend up whole. That just slayed me. And I just kept doing it <laughs> until it was ridiculous. <laughs> This is nice for the kind of more courtesy stuff, Curtis Mayfield kind of stuff, I guess. I don't know if I've done that already or... I actually very rarely use this sound anymore. I, I, I don't really like it. Hardly ever. I use this quite a bit for uh, with William Bell, the soul gig. This to me is a... Kind of your classic, um, uh, like, R&B rhythm sound, like... Like if you're doing in that kind of even slightly Motown thing, like. Um, all that kind of stuff. These, the, that's these two, which classic telly, really lovely, really nice. That was fun. <clears throat>